نحمد و نسلی علا رسول کریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسلی امری و احلل اقدتم من لسانی یفقہ قولی و جعلی وزیر بن اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اللہم انی اسألکا حبکا و حب من یحبکا و عمل اللذی یبن لغنی حبکا اللہم ارین الحق حقا و رزقن اتباعا اللہم ارین الباطل باطلا و رزقن اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہو سورہ سبا This surah was revealed in Makkah. It has 54 verses, 6 tenzas, and 34 by the order of revolution. From here is starting the fifth group of the surahs of Quran. And this fifth group has seven surahs which were revealed in Makkah and three which were revealed in Medina. So this is the first surah of, first Makki surah of the fifth group. The name of the surah is because in the verse number 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ قَانَ لِسَبَعٍ فِي مَسْكِنِهِمْ آيَةٌ That in the people of uh, the people of the nation of Saba, there is a lesson or a moral for you. Regarding the time period of revolution, it was the middle period of of the life of Prophet ﷺ in Mecca and the basic uh, topics and the summary or the theme of the surah is that uh, first of all we will see that in the verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer all the criticisms which were being carried out by the opponents of Prophet ﷺ. And uh, the main basic theme of and the message of the surah is about teaching all those who are going to recite the surah is being grateful to Allah to acknowledge the blessings of Allah, that is gratitude. And to explain that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a person into trial by blessing him, then the most important behavior which Allah desires from this blessed person is, is gratitude. And to explain this manner of gratitude, Allah has given two examples. One of Hazrat Dawood who himself is a story of gratitude. And the second is a narration of the people of Saba, who were a blessed community, but when they were ungrateful, so they ended up in a totally a deprived state by the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Hillazi lehuma fis sama wati wama fil ardi. Walahul hamdu fil ahira. Wahual haki mul habir. All praise is due to Allah. To whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth, and to him belongs all praise in hereafter, and he is the wise, the acquainted. So now there is another surah of Quran which is starting with the words of Alhamdulillah. And this Alhamdulillah is what? Five surahs of Quran, they start with this phrase of Alhamdulillah. Just uh, revising again. It trains us, it reminds us of what? What we already learned in Surah Fatiha. It trains us gratitude, patience, remembrance, and humbleness in front of Allah and his bondsmen also. So now, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has started the topic by talking about his praise and his gratitude. Verse number two, he knows what penetrates into the earth and what emerges from it and what descends from the heaven and what ascends therein. He is the merciful, <coughs> he is the merciful, the forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and he is the master of all the masters and he is the controller of all the controllers he in this verse is explaining how he knows what is happening where in the universe in the heavens and the earth 
Now the word says, what goes in the earth? So we need to know what goes in the earth is like all the seeds of the plants and then the insects and the animals in their burrows under the ground. Water, which flows on the surface, it slowly seeps inside and goes down in the earth as an underground water. Then all those buried and hidden treasures, which people use to bury to keep them safe. And then finally, last but not the least, the dead bodies of all the deceased who are buried in their graves. And then on the day of judgment, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, that the earth will take out, will throw out whatever it is, there is in it. And all the people will say what has happened with it, what is the problem, what is the issue with it. And Allah says, that earth will narrate all what used to happen on the earth. And this will all be because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire the earth to do so. And then Allah says, Allah knows what comes out, what emerges of the earth, like all the growing or the sprouting shoots from coming out from the seeds of the plant and the springs, fountains flowing in the form of streams and rivers. Allah knows all that. And finally, Allah knows of the lava from the volcanic eruptions which comes out of the earth and also the crops in the fields which are coming out from the earth. And Allah knows and will know all the dead on the day of resurrection. As is said in the Quran, that when it will be blown in the trumpet on the day of judgment and people, they will come out from their graves and they will be marching towards their rub and they will say and they will announce that who has woken us up from our sleep in our graves. And then there, there are, again, the insects and the animals which go in and they come out also. And then the mineral reservoir, the mineral reservoirs and all the ores which are exploited, the ores of gold and silver and precious stones and the, all the mines and all the rest of the minerals of gas and coal and oil, all these things which are the natural minerals and natural reservoirs, they come out of the earth and Allah knows all of that which has been exploited and which are being taken out by the human beings for their uses. And what comes down or descends from the heaven like the rain, the snow, winds, stones, all the thunder, the lightning, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the sunlight, the UV rays which are coming down from all over the universe falling on the earth. And then the meteors and the meteorites which are falling on the surface of the earth from the space. And then Allah knows all the angels all the angels who descend daily, morning and the evening, who descend daily from the heavens, carrying on their duties and all the angels which are bringing what? The orders of Allah. So Allah knows all that, what descends. And then Allah knows what rises up in the heavens also. What rises in the heaven? The water vapors, the water vapors of the water cycle, the steam, the clouds, heat, the currents, the birds flying up and down. And then the souls, the souls of the deceased, which are taken by the death angels. And then what rises up in the heavens is the deeds, the deeds of all the people. They are, they are taken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala morning and evening after Fajr and after Asr and every morning and, and every Monday and every Thursday. And then what rises in the, in the heavens till the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Supplications supplications of the bondsmen they raised to the thrones of Allah and the last word the last words of the verse are the attributes of Allah which Allah has mentioned here is that he is what he is the merciful and forgiving now we do realize that in all in uh, many of the verses of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the thing and then in the end he narrates an attribute of Allah and remember Whichever attribute of Allah is related in uh, is narrated in any verse is obviously related to the message of the verse also. Because you see here, 
Allah is not mentioning that he is As-Sami or Al-Khabir or Al-Basir. Allah is saying that he is Al-Rahim, the merciful, and Al-Ghafur, the forgiving. Why? How does it relate with the message of the verse? Because Allah says that I know what entered the earth and what leaves the earth. And all these are what? A source of blessing for all of you. You exploit them, you use them, and they are for your service. And Allah knows what blessings are descending from the heavens for you and what orders have been issued from the heavens for you. And despite knowing all that and seeing all that, what, what deeds the bondsmen are sending towards Allah what deeds are rising towards the heaven for Allah to see? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, despite knowing all blessings and bounties which are coming from the earth or entering into the earth or falling from the heaven and the orders which Allah has given in response to all of these, despite that which whichever deeds are being sent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the bondsmen, how sinful, how disobedient, how, how full of transgression they are, despite of knowing all the blessings and bounties and seeing the response of behavior, he is no doubt the merciful and forgiving. Allahumma hasibna hisabi yusira, rabbi khfir warham wa anta arhamur rahimin. But those who disbelieve say the hour will not come to us. Say, yes, by my Lord, it will surely come to you. Allah is the knower of the unseen. Not absent from him is an atom's weight within the heaven or within the earth or what is smaller than that or greater, except that it is in a clear register that he might he may reward those who believe and do righteous deeds. Those will have forgiveness and noble provision. But those who strive against our verses, seeking to cause failure, for them will be a painful punishment of foul nature. And those who have been given knowledge, see that what is revealed to you from your Lord is the truth, and it guides to the path of the exalted in might and praiseworthy. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, Allahumma ikhtina sirat al mustaqim. But those who disbelieve say, shall we direct you to a man who will inform you that when you have disintegrated in complete disintegration, you will then be recreated in a new creation? Has he invented about Allah a lie or is there in him a madness? Rather, they who do not believe in the hereafter will be in the punishment and are in extreme error. Then. Do they not look at what is before them and what is behind them of heaven and earth? And if we should will, we could cause the earth to swallow them or could let fall upon them the fragments of the sky. Indeed, in that is a, is a sign for every servant turning back to Allah. Verse number 10, and we certainly gave Dawud salam from us bounty. We said, O mountains, repeat our praises with him and the birds as well. And we made him ply, and we made pliable for him iron. Now, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Hazrat Dawud alayhi salam. His story and his narration is a narration of full of gratitude. He was blessed by the bounties of Allah, for which he was continuously totally grateful and he still stayed humble. And so the rule of Allah, as Allah has proclaimed in Quran, La in shakartum, la azid dannakum, wala in kafartum, inna azabi la shadid. That if you stay grateful to Allah and that if you exhibit and demonstrate gratitude in your behavior in response to the blessings of Allah, then Allah will do what? La azid dannakum. Allah promises that for sure I will bless you with even greater amount of my blessings and bounties. So this rule of Allah, it worked for Hazrat Dawud because of his gratitude to Allah, Allah kept on blessing him more and more. And the more he had, the more grateful he, he was, and the more he was blessed by Allah. So 
we realize that like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with a very, very melodious voice. So as a gratitude for this blessing, what he used to do was that he used to keep on reciting and praising, glorifying, exalting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this melodious voice of his. And pleased with his gratitude, Allah blessed him with Zabur. And what was it? It was a book of poetic exaltations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And receiving this, his recitations and his glorifying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further increased as gratitude, even more to express his gratitude for being blessed and for being revealed Zabur. Allah was so pleased that he ordered his creation, the birds to to recite with Hazrat Dawood and the mountains to recite the exaltations accompanying Dawood alayhi salam. Subhanallah, subhanallah, what, what, a, what a wonderful scene it must have been. Recitations, recitations of the glorifying and the exalting verses of Zabur by Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam in his melodious voice, synchronizing with what? With the, with the humming of the birds and the echoing of the mountains in the background. This was what? These were all the rewards of gratitude. And then in the last part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions another, another blessing, al-hadid, that iron was made soft and pliable for him. Traditions narrate that Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide him with some skill and some knowledge and skill so that would be a source of halal and lawful earning for him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him the skill to make things out of iron. And if we relate the period of Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam with the periods of human history, we will find out that it exactly tallies with the iron age of human history, which is roughly about 1100 years BC. So what did he do with after receiving this skill was that re receiving this skill as a blessing from Allah, he expressed his gratitude by using this skill to make armors for the Muslim soldiers and for the Muslim Mujahideen and for the wars against, against the enemies of Islam. So what was he doing was that he was using all his blessings according to the orders of Allah, within the limits of Allah, and also in the path of Allah for the service of Islam and for the service of his bondsmen and for the service of the Muslim Mujahideen. This is what gratitude is. And this is how we actually need to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings he has blessed us. And he has rightly mentioned about his blessings. That if you try counting your blessings, you will not be able to count them. How innumerable, how countless, how endless. Allahumma aini ala ghamarat al-maut wa sakarat al-maut. Rabbi aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. So once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made pliable for him iron, what did he command? He commanded him make full coats of mail and calculate precisely the links and work all of you in righteousness. Indeed, I of what you do am seeing. And to Suleiman alayhi salam, we subjected the wind. Its morning journey was that of a month and its afternoon journey was that of a month. And we made flow for him a spring of liquid copper and among the jinn were those who worked for him by the permission of his Lord and whoever deviated among them from our command, we will make him taste of the punishment of blaze. Now, since Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam was extremely grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all his blessings, so he kept on. Allah kept on the merciful. Allah kept on blessing him more and more. And finally, he was blessed with what? With a pious son, Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam, who descended him in his kingship and who was also uh, he was also a prophet, prophet as a descendant of Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam. Now, Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam, his period was 
to from 1000 to 1300 BC. And this precisely is the Bronze Age of human history. Now, Hazrat Suleiman salam, very much like his father, as they say, like father, like son, like Hazrat Dawud salam, he also excelled in gratitude towards Allah. He was a successful successor of Hazrat Dawud salam, in his prophethood and in his kingship. And he was blessed with a vast kingdom, a kingdom which was even more vast than the vastness of Hazrat Dawud alayhi salam. And the, he being blessed with this vast Islamic kingdom and an Islamic state, he was extremely vigilant in, in the administration and in the supervision and the surveillance of all the matters of the state. And so he would travel extensively. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him and eased his extensive laborious travels for when he would travel by the sea, wind would blow by the orders of Allah, wind would start blowing in the direction he desired to travel, speeding up the sailing ships. And by the order of Allah, Hazrat Suleiman was also given the control of the jinns. He was the master of jinns by the order of Allah. And uh, despite of having such supernatural authorities, he still was humbled and he was what? He was grateful. And that is where we learn that humbleness and gratitude, they go hand in hand. And how did he behave? And how did he use all these blessings of Allah? Verse number 13, they made for him who the jinns made for Hazrat Suleiman what he willed of elevated chambers, statues, bowls like reservoirs and stationary kettles. We said work of family of Dawood alayhi salam in gratitude and few of my masters of my servants are grateful. Now the jinns who were under control of Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam, what did he make them do? All positive, productive, tasks for the welfare of humanity and for the service of Islam. This is his gratitude. Now, the jinns were the order of their master, Hazrat Suleiman salam, they constructed, as Allah says here, maharib. Maharib means what? It refers to huge palaces and huge forts which with, with elevated chambers. And why Hazrat Suleiman salam got these constructed was not as an exhibition of his wealth or his power or as a exhibition or demonstration or show off or riyah of his authority and his rule and the vastness of his kingdom and the strength and power of his subordinates. No, they were, he got all these made and constructed to provide residence for the poor, needy, orphans, and the widows. And moreover, they were constructed to provide or to be a place to train and to launch the mujahideen for jihad and the scholars of Islam for the purpose of teaching and preaching the messages of Allah. So that is why all these forts and fortresses and palaces and elevated chambers, they were made to, the jinns were made to construct. And then the next thing which were made <coughs> with the jinns made was Jafanin Kal Jawab, huge cooking pots and huge utensils, serving pots and cooking pots, giant sized serving and cooking pots. The purpose of all these was to let Hazrat uh, Suleiman be very generous and on a large scale. <coughs> <clears throat> for letting as a Suleiman salam be very generous and extend his hospitality on a very large scale. 
And then these giant size serving and cooking pots were for the purpose of uh, extensive cooking. It was not for, again, not for israf or overspending or extravagance or uh, wastefulness or any form of exhibition and demonstration or to throw out huge parties and events for his demonstration and his arrogance, no, but they were to feed, to feed all those were the deprived like all those were the have-nots of the society, they would be an asylum for the deprived or to host for the mujahideen or to be a place of hospitality for the preachers, preachers of Islam and the scholars of Islam. So this is exactly how he showed his gratitude for all these blessings and all these powers and authorities blessed to him by Allah. Allahumma ja'alni saburan wa ja'alni shakura. And then there were the tamasil. But before I talk about the tamasil, I would want to stop here and I would want to make a clarification of a few false allegations which were made on Hazrat Dawood and Hazrat Suleiman, both the father and the son, with the interest of creating permission of a few unlawful activities. There are a few things which are considered unlawful in Islam, but but considering that they say that since Hazrat Suleiman and Hazrat Dawood indulged in those activities in their lives, so they are not lawful, but they are permissible and they are lawful being the sunnah of a prophet. And this behavior is used to justify the unlawful activities they are committing and proving that they are thus not prohibited or unlawful in Islam. So a few of these things are, number one, doing magic with control of jinns. As we've already talked in Surah Baqarah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا قَفَرَ سُلَيْمَان وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينِ قَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسِ السَّحَرِ That the people of Bani Israel, when they started indulging in all forms of magic and sorcery, they used to say that one of our prophets one of our prophets, that is Hazrat Suleiman he had jinn in his control and he got services from the jinns who were in his control. So if we do so, it is permissible and it is not a sin to do so. But in fact, it is what? It is a sunnah of our prophet. Now, how do we relate to all that? You know, jinns who were in the control of Hazrat Suleiman were not with the Prophet's own will and were not with the Prophet's own efforts, like, like the nasty and the filthy activities of the magicians who, who come out with all forms of filthy and nasty and sinful activities to get hold of the control of the jinns. The, the jinns who were under the control of Hazrat Suleiman was not because of that, but just because of the will and order of Allah. And moreover, we also see and observe that Hazrat Suleiman used to make the jinns do what? All forms of productive services, all forms of productive, constructive services for the service of humanity and service of Islam. Whereas in contrast to that, the magicians, they, they with the services of the jinns, their activities are all corruption and malice and shar. So, there is no justification whatsoever according to this uh, blessing which Hazrat Suleiman was blessed with. The second thing is that people say that Hazrat Dawood used to sing. And so from here they assume that singing or listening to songs or music is not unlawful and is very much permissible because it was the sunnah of Hazrat Dawood so let me explain all this. Now, the question is that what did, first of all, what did Hazrat Dawood what was he reciting was, he was exalting Allah, he was glorifying Allah, and he was praising Allah with the Zabur, reciting the verses of Zabur, reciting the words of a divine scripture. And Moreover, was there any form of accompanying musical instruments or orchestra in the background? No, nothing of the sort whatsoever. 
his recitations of the verses of Zabur in his God-gifted melodious voice, totally without any music or background orchestra, it cannot be used to justify justify the rocking music and the vulgar poetry in the songs of today. And in any case, I have talked about in detail in Surah Luqman where we were discussing what Lahwal Hadith means. And the third thing what people mention is about the Tamasil. Tamasil, which have been mentioned here in this verse, the people create a justification for permission of painting and making sculptures according to the teachings of Islam. Now, what do we mean by tamasil? Tamasil derives from misal. Misal means similar. And tamasil is the plural for misal. And it is used for every such thing which is made to resemble a natural thing. So anything which is similar to or is made or is created in a way that it resembles a thing naturally created by Allah, whether it may be a human being or an animal, a tree, a flower, a river, or, or some inanimate object, but tamasil would be a word for every artificially made things which have been made to resemble the naturally created things of creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what we mean by tamasil. And uh, they said that since Hazrat Suleiman asked the jinns to make the tamasil in his palaces and in his fortresses, so we can also adopt this behavior and it is lawful and it is a sunnah of the prophet itself. Now, what did they actually what were the jinns actually making by the order of Hazrat Suleiman and what were the tamasil which were put to, uh, which were exhibited in the palaces? We, they did make pictures and we learn from the words of, uh, we learn from some traditions that these were entirely, they, com they, um, they were comprised entirely of paintings and images of the non-living creatures. And the purpose of making the paintings and images of the non-living creatures was, number one, to decorate the palaces, to dec decorate the palaces and increase the splendor and increase the magnificence of the Muslim construction. And thirdly, to provide because these were the pictures of the natural sceneries. So uh, the purpose was to provide a continuous reminder of the creations of Allah. And uh, then to bring people closer to nature, paintings of flowers and trees and natural sceneries and landscapes of uh, like fountains and mountains. This was what? This was just keeping the environment beautifying the environment and the palaces and keeping the people close to nature also. So there were no images of living creations of any sort at all. And similarly, traditions also prove that by the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu and by words of multiple traditions and ahadith of Prophet Sallallahu making of paintings and statues of living objects is not permissible and it is categorically has been declared as unlawful according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha has been, report, she reports that um, Hazrat Umm Habiba and Hazrat Umm Salma radiallahu ta'ala anha, they had seen a church in Habsha, and uh, there were pictures in it, and they mentioned about it before Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said that the cursed custom among those people was that when a pious man from among them died, they would build a house of worship at his grave, and they would make his picture on it. 
And then he added that on the day of resurrection, these people will be among the most wretched creatures in the sign of Allah, in the sight of Allah. And this has been reported in Muslim. Similarly, Hazrat Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, who reports in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu said that Allah has cursed the maker of pictures. And similarly, Hazrat Abu Zurah said that once it has been reported in Musnad Ahmad and Bukhari, that he said that once when I entered a house along with Hazrat Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, and who, I saw that a painter was making a picture at the top. And Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who said that I have heard Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that Allah says, who could be more wicked than the one who tries to create a thing like my creation? Let them, if they can, create a seed or an ant. So this is an, an act or a deed which is highly disliked by the creator himself. Similarly, on um, the authority of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who is a tradition that uh, Prophet sallallahu was present at the funeral prayer. And there he announced and he asked that who from among you will go to Medina and will demolish every idol that he sees and level down every grave that he sees and blots out every picture that he sees. And a person said that he would go. He went, but he came back without carrying out the task because he was afraid that people will be like offended. And then Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who he went and he conducted the whole process. And then he came back and he said that I have demolished every idol and I have leveled every grave and I have blotted every picture. And then Prophet sallallahu said that now, if anyone made any of these he would be denying the teaching sent down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it has been reported in Muslim Ahmad and Bukha and Muslim. Similarly, Hazrat Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he reports that um, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he who made a picture would be compelled to breathe the soul into it, which he will not be able to do. And this is reported in Bukhari. Similarly, uh, it has been reported that um, Hazrat Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala knew that came, person came and he said that I am, a person asked him that I am a man who earns his living with his hand and my profession is to make pictures. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala knew replied that shall I not tell you the same which I've heard Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say that he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compel the person who makes pictures and he will not be left until he breathes the soul into it. And he will never be able to breathe the soul into it. And the person's face, he turned pale. And um, he, was, he, was, um, he, was, he was seeking uh, forgiveness for what he had been doing throughout his life as a profession. Similarly, Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood, ta'ala, who reports in Bukhari, the Prophet said that on the day of resurrection, the ones to be the most severely punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the painters of pictures. And then we know of an occasion when Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and Hashi had bought a cushion for Prophet to come back. He was coming back from a travel and to make him, make him comfortable, she bought a cushion on which there were pictures painted. And when Prophet came, and he stood at the door and he looked at it. He asked, what is this cushion for? And she said that it was here that he may sit on it and he may recline on it. And then Prophet Salaam added that the painters of these pictures, they will be compelled on the day of resurrection and they will be asked to put life into it, whatever they have made. And the angels do not enter a house which has picture in it. The angels of mercy do not enter the house in which there are pictures. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she reports in Bukhari that one day Prophet sallallahu came to my house and I had hung a curtain which had pictures on it. And some traditions say that there were pictures of horses on it. And Prophet ﷺ, when he saw this, the color of his face changed as if he was not happy. He was angry. He was furious. And he, got, he took hold of the curtain and he tore it. 
And he said, those who try to create like the creation of, the, of Allah will be among those who will be the most severely punished on the day of resurrection. And it has been reported in Muslim. And uh, uh, Hazrat Aisha also said that he asked me to remove it. And there are multiple events in, similar to this in the life of Prophet ﷺ when he ordered people to take away all these cushions and curtains which had pictures on them. Similarly, uh, Prophet ﷺ said that the angels of mercy do not enter the house where there is a dog or when they, where there is a picture and it is boarded in Bukhari. So, and then there was an occasion in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he went to see somebody, he went to pay a visit and uh, Hazrat Jibreel Alayhi Salam had promised to pay Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a visit and he had specified the time. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going to, was in somebody's house as a guest and uh, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam there did not arrive at the specified fixed appointed time. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam felt troubled and he was upset and he came out of the house. And when he came out of the house, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam came and he met him. And there Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam asked him why he had delayed his meeting. And Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam replied that we do not enter a house where there is a dog or a picture. And it has been reported in Bukhari, in Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tarimdi, Nathai, Ibn Majah, by Imam Malik also. So we need to remember all these teachings of Quran and refrain from uh, exhibiting and demonstrating or putting up pictures or statues of living things in our houses. However, photographs where it becomes mandatory, like for educational purposes or for introduction or for entity, like on driving licenses or passports or visas, et cetera, they might be used. And uh, there is a ruling for, of um, some scholars regarding all these matters also. <clears throat> so they made all these by the order of Hazrat uh, Suleiman alayhi salam, verse number 14. And when we decreed for Suleiman alayhi salam death, nothing indicated to the jinn his death except a creature, uh, a creature, a creature of the earth eating his staff. But when he fell, it became clear to the jinn that if they did not, if they had not known the unseen, they would not have remained in the humiliating punishment. What was all this about was that Hazrat Suleiman was um, getting the Heqle Suleimani in Baitul Maqdis. He was getting that constructed by the jinns. And what he used to do was that he had a glass chamber made for himself. He used to sit there to keep uh, observing the jinns while they were constructing so that they could be supervised and he could carry on his surveillance and checking and monitoring all of them. But at the same time, in his glass chamber, exclusive private glass chamber, since there was no disturbance and distraction by the outer, sign, outer so, uh, noises and the voices, he would uh, continue his worship and he would continue uh, his, uh, his uh, reciting the verses and uh, glorifying and exalting and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a beautiful blend and what a beautiful combination of duty being carried along with the remembrance and worship of Allah. This is moderation in life and this is being dutiful and this is also a manner of remembrance of Allah which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Imran that ulul albab are whom alladhina yathkurun Allah qiyama wa qa'udun wa ala junubihim that they while performing their duties of Allah and their duties of bondsmen their worldly duties they do not neglect but at the same time concurrently their hearts are in the remembrance of Allah and their tongue is what it is supple with the remembrance and glorification of Allah 
Rabbi Aini Allah Zikrika wa Shukrika wa Khusne Ibadatik. Now, this verse shows what happened when death attended Hazrat uh, Suleiman alayhi salam. And he was sitting in his chair, he was supported by his staff, and he kept on sitting. And the body didn't feel, then didn't fall back. And the gents, they kept on thinking that he was alive, and they kept on working as if they were not unaware, they were not aware of his death. That is, that is, their master had passed off and they were now free. So what we learned from this verse was that the jinns who could not get the right knowledge of something which was right in front of their eyes, how possibly can they tell of the future to people as they relate with jinns and the people, all the magicians and all the sorcerers who have jinns in their control? Verse 15, there was for the tribe of Saba in their dwelling, a place of sign, two fields of gardens on the right and on the left. They were told, eat from the provisions of your Lord and be grateful to him. A good land have you and a forgiving Lord. Now from this verse number 15 onwards for the next few verses is the story of the ungrateful people of Saba. People of Saba is they were a well-known nation of, Sad, of the southern Arab Peninsula. A person named Saba was the pioneer to settle here. So the name of the nation came after the pioneer settler. Southwest part of the Arab Peninsula today, which is the land of Yemen, was the land of the people of Saba. And the period was almost about 1100 BC, was almost the same period of Hazrat Suleiman salam. These people, they were the fire worshippers. They were the fire worshippers and uh, they were a blessed nation. And they were blessed with like all the resources of pro prosperity. Like they had a fertile land. This itself was a gift of Allah. This land was excellent for cultivation of all forms. They were orchards as in this verse Allah says, there were fields of gardens on the right and the left. That is, there were orchards and there were fields of cultivation like on all the sides. And with scents of fruits and scents of plants, coming out of these beautiful plants and there was greenery and there was a beautiful view and then there were there was agricultural benefits also and then there was a perfect system of irrigation this system of irrigation had been evolved like similar to those evolved by the ancient babylonians they were surrounded by sea on all the three sides and then there were heavy rainfalls also with streams and with rivers flowing on the land and on top of all this, they had the skill to build up and to construct an intricate network of channels and streams for irrigation. So they had skill also, they also had the skill to build dams for water reservoirs. And the biggest dam they built has been known as Sadde Ma'arib. And this has been mentioned in the books of history. So they had all res resources for uh, excellent agricultural yields and all sorts of fruits and all sorts of crops would grow in their lands because all forms of excellent resources of agriculture. Then the next thing they had was a flourishing trade. They were geographically stationed at the intersection of very prominent and imminent land and sea trade routes. And their traders, they would travel very easily and conveniently to the east and to the west, trading with the people of the subcontinent, Africa, Rome, Greece, Syria, Egypt, trading with them all forms of spices and silks and jewels. And then on top of that, they had a remarkably excellent skill of architecture. They built magnificent and glamorous palaces and the huge palaces, they decorated them with paintings and carvings and statues and the ceilings, they were painted with beautiful colors and they were inlays of gold and copper and silver. And the utensils in these palaces were also of gold and silver. 
and in the fireplaces they used to they used to light up the sandalwood with scent coming out of their chimneys spreading out in the colonies the biggest palace the palace of hamadan it was situated it was situated on one of the highest peaks of a highest mountain so there was there was remarkable blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on them and then there were beautiful scents spreading from all around their orchards and their palaces ships who used to sail ships sailing in the surrounding seas they used to catch sight of the palaces from miles away and getting the scents sailors used to call out miles away it looks as if the city of saba is approaching subhanallah how gifted were they how gifted were they as a nation as a community as a locality but how did they behave how disobedient how extremely ungrateful were they to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the merciful the blessed what they did was this rather than implementing the laws and the system of the merciful lord the sustainer on the land of the lord they had the laws of disobedience they had adopted the laws of transgression and they were worshiping they were worshiping the sun and they were worshiping the fire instead of the creator himself this invited the wrath of allah this invited the wrath of allah and the torments of allah fell on all of them what happened and how the torment of allah started and the punishment of allah started on this ungrateful nation was that by the order of allah a wall of the biggest dam the sadd ma'arib the wall of sadd ma'arib cracked and it gave way and the water flooded washed off all the lands perishing the palaces the orchards the fields the feats of architecture and their skill leaving the land unfertile and the survivors after all this when all the things had perished and nothing was left and the land was turned unfertile then the survivors they faced a famine and the land was all barren they migrated from here they immigrated to settle in other lands and some of them settled in the old city of medina which was then called as yathrib and these were the people who were the ancestors of the aws and khazraj of medina and because they were born warriors they forced out the three tribes of jews who had settled in medina before them and so the jews the three tribes of the jews they uh, settled in the suburbs and the outskirts of medina and the heart of medina was uh, then populated by these people the immigrants to yathrib the aws and khazraj tribes came from them after them after they settled here so now i'll be reading and we will know how they behaved and how they were punished despite being all the provided with all the provisions and blessings of allah as have been mentioned in the verse number 15 what happened is but they turned away they turned away refusing so we sent upon them the flood of the dam and we replaced their two fields of gardens with gardens of bitter fruits <coughs> with garden of bitter fruits and something of sparse load trees but by that we repaid them because they disbelieved and do we thus repay except the ungrateful and we placed between them and the cities which we had blessed many visible cities and we determined between them the distances of journey saying travel between them by night or day in safety but insolently they said our lord lengthen the distances between our journeys and wronged themselves so we made them narrations and dispersed them in total dispersion indeed and in that are signs for everyone patient and grateful allahumma ja'alni saburan wa ja'alni shakura rabbi a'inni ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik 
and Iblis had already confirmed through them his assumption, so they followed him except for a party of believers, and he had over them no authority except it was decreed that we might make evident who believes in hereafter from from who is there of in doubt, and your Lord over all things is a guardian. Say, invoke those you claim as deities besides Allah. They do not possess any atom's weight of ability in the heavens or on the earth, and they do not have there in any partnership with him, nor is there for him from among them any assistant. Verse 23. An intercession does not benefit with him except for one whom he permits. And those and those wait until when terror is removed from their hearts, they will say to one another, what has your Lord said? They will say the truth. And he is the most high, the grand. So the most high and the most grand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, mentioning a rule and the law regarding the day of judgment, the rule of intercession on the day of judgment. There is no doubt that intercession on the day of judgment is a fact. Allah will allow intercession but the conditions for intercessions, which we need to have faith on and we need to correct, maintain the correct faith of intercession, we need to know is that who will intercede, who will be allowed to intercede, will be strictly with the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we learn in the verse of throne in Surah Al-Baqarah, Man zallazi yashfa wa indahu illa bi'izni. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will be according to the discretion, the discretion to grant the right to intercede will only be with the will, with the permission and order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first thing, that who will be allowed to intercede. The second thing, who will be interceded or who will receive intercession will be also strictly by the orders and permission of Allah Almighty, Maliki Yawmiddin. The third thing, the sole discretion to accept or reject any intercession will also be by the will and order and permission, and it will be the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth thing regarding the concept of faith of intercession we need to know is that the receiver of intercession must be or will have to be a believer in oneness of Allah Thus, intercession will only be accepted in favor of all those who have not indulged in polytheism in any form or the other. So in nutshell, if I sum up who will intercede, for whom will be the intercession, for what will be the intercession, when will be the intercession, how much will be interceded, and what out of the intercession will be accepted and granted will strictly be by the order and by the will of Allah. So the polytheistic belief about intercession that walis and kutubs and the alims and the scholars of the saints, they will intercede before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment for anyone and for everyone they would want for anything they would wish. And they would just sit like, like insisting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will not go, we will not leave our position till until and unless you accept our intercession for our followers. May they be saints, may they be scholars. No, this is what, this sort of a belief relating intercession with the will and with the, with the insisting of the saints and the scholars, this amounts to polytheism. This is a polytheistic belief. We should know and understand that Allah to honor his prophets, his messengers, his martyrs, his reciters, his scholars, his righteous, fear, um, the pious people will allow them intercession of whom 
for whom, for whichever matter, whenever, to whichever extent he would want. There will be nothing more than that, nothing short of that. Like we learn that on the day of judgment, Quran will come as an intercessor. And Quran will say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I stopped him from sleeping and the Quran will intercede. And similarly, we know that Prophet ﷺ has advised us that recite az zahrawain the two shining surahs of Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran, recite them because they will, they will intercede for their reciters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet ﷺ has promised that there will be no, there will be nothing which will be more powerful in intercession as the Quran. And Quran will be an intercession whose intercession will not be negated and disregarded. And then we also learn that fasts will also intercede and fast will come up and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was I who prevented him from eating despite the fact that he was hungry and his, its intercession will be accepted. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the leader of all the prophets will intercede on the day of judgment. The day of judgment when people will be saying, Haza yawmun usr, this is a day of hardship. And the day when even the prophets and the messengers will be calling out, nafsi, nafsi, oh our souls, oh our souls. And there is a very lengthy tradition which I will be narrating the message in my own words, that when all the people, all the people on the day of judgment, they will, they will go to all the prophets and they will be asking and requesting for intercession. And people will go to Hazrat Adam alayhi salam and they will request him for intercession, but he will refuse and he will say that I myself I have committed a disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while I consumed the fruit of the forbidden tree in heaven. And I am concerned about my own cell. So you go to somebody else. And then the people will come to Ibrahim alayhi salam and they will ask him to intercede for him, asking him that you were Khalilullah and you were the friend of Allah and he bestowed his bounties and favors on you. But he will say, he will mention his Torah he was mentioned his Tauria, and he will say that he committed it and he will be also upset regarding his forgiveness and he will ask them to go and they will come to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and he will say that I killed a person and he will be anxious about his own forgiveness also and then people will come to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and he will say that my nation started worshipping me behind me and I'm worried about that, that they, they indulged in polytheism and so we see that all the prophets, one after the other, will go on refusing and they will be referring to Prophet Wasallam for his intercession. And then they will come to him and he will intercede for his followers. And then there is another lengthy narration in which Prophet Wasallam has explained how he will intercede. He explained that I will, I will reach my my pool, my river of Qasr, which I have been blessed. I have been promised that I will be blessed on the day of judgment. And I will, I will distribute the water of the hoth of Qasr or the river of Qasr. And he said that those who will drink out of it, they will never feel thirsty again. And those who will be deprived of the water, they will, their thirst will never quench. And he said also, he's explained in other traditions that he said, the companions asked him that, how will you recognize us? And he added, it has been explained in Bukhari that he added, I will recognize my followers by the shining parts of the body, the shining parts of the wudu, the parts that were washed with the water of wudu. And he added that, Whoever wants to increase the shining of the parts of the body of Udu, he may do so. And he also has explained to all of us that I will see some people and I will recognize some people as my followers, but I will see and I will observe that the angels will be stopping them to come towards them. And I will ask, why are these followers of mine being stopped to get to me? And then the angels will tell me 
that O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you do not know that after you they had created innovations, they had fabricated such and such issues in religion. These were whom who had created innovations, bid'ah, for which Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said, "Kullu bid'atin zolala," that all the innovations are what they are misguided. And Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told all of us that anyone who respects or regards or honors a person committing innovations, indulging in bidah, laysa minna. He is not among the followers of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then how will he intercede? And how will he ask for forgiveness for his ummah? There is, there is a tradition, again, a lengthy tradition when I will be narrating the summary in my own words that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, that every prophet was granted a supplication which would be accepted. And all the prophets made the supplication in their life, but I postponed it for the day of judgment. So when there will be, where there will be accountability of all the day of judgment and people will go to the hellfire and then some of them in, will be as, will reach the Jannah as inmates of Jannah, then what will happen is, Prophet Sallallahu said, then I will make a very lengthy prostration and I will prostrate and I will glorify Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in my prostration and I will call out and I will be called out and said, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, lift your, lift your forehead and ask for what you want. And what will he ask for? Will he ask for the blessings of the day of judgment for Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhu and half of which for whom he used to say Fatima is a part of my body no in her life he had informed her ya Fatima in kizi nafsiki min annar fa inni la amluku min allah shayya O oh, Fatma, you work, you strive, you struggle to save yourself from the hellfire. I will not be able to help you on the day of judgment. I can just inform you and warn you in this worldly life. Will it be, will he ask, will he worry about Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and who, and how, who was her, his most dearest and beloved wife? No, what, he'll, what will he be saying? Ya Allah, Ummati, O oh Allah, my followers. And then he will make another second prostration and the third prostration and the whole event and the dialogue will be repeated three times. And by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, huge handfuls of people of the prophet, of the followers of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who were the inmates of hellfire, they will be taken out by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even the person who had faith and belief equal to the seed of mustard, he will also be taken out from the hell fire by the intercession of Prophet ﷺ, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to think and we need to ponder and we need to remember how much Prophet ﷺ loves all of us and will love also all of us when he will intercede for us on the day of judgment. Let's ask all of, all of ourselves, do we love him as much? Do we love, protect, promote, guard what was dearest to him? What? Islam, Quran. Are we spending our money, time, capabilities to invite, to introduce, to teach, to promote, to propagate, to implement Islam, his beloved religion? Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amal allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. And then when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will cross, he will be the first, he said himself, that he will be the first to cross the bridge of Sarat. He will stand on the other end and he will see his followers coming. And what will he be supplicating? He will be asking, Sallim Rabbi Sallim. Save, save them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and keep them, keep them in your protection and save them, save them and protect them from hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all with the love, with the respect, with the regard of Prophet sallallahu and help us all follow the teachings and the messages of hadith and sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 
Say, who provides for you from the heavens and earth, say Allah. And indeed we or you are either upon guidance or in a clear error. Say, you will not be asked about what we committed and we will not be asked about what you do. Say, our Lord will bring us together, then we will. Then he will judge between us in truth and he is the knowing judge. Say, show me those whom you have attached to him as partners. No, rather, he alone is Allah, the exalted in might and wise. Verse number 28. And we have not sent you except comprehensively to mankind as a bringer of good tidings and a warner, but most of the people do not know. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the point of a uh, prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not towards a specific locality or a specific time period. He, Allah is saying, have not sent to sent you except comprehensively to all the mankind. Similarly, Allah has said in Surah Anbiya, Wama arsalnaka illa rahmatul lil alameen. And in Surah Araf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nasu, inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'a. And it has been reported in Mustad Ahmad that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that I have been sent towards all the mankind, white and black, all the Muslims and all the non-Muslims. And he said that previous prophets were sent to a nation. I have been sent to all the humanity. Remember the teachings and messages of Quran and the teachings and messages of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sunnah and Hadith. They were not just for the area of Makkah and Medina, but for all the globe, for all the hemispheres of the earth. And they were not just for the time period of Prophet ﷺ and his life, but for all the ages till the day of judgment. Remember, Islam is a global religion. Islam knows no boundaries. The invitation of Islam has to be has to be and is extended in Quran to whom Ya Ayyuhanna Su'budu Rabbakum Allazi Khalaqakum Min Nafsin Wahida. This invitation of Islam has to be extended to all those in all the periods extending from the period of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the period to the day of judgment. And they say when is this promise if you should be truthful say for you is the appointment of the day when you will not remain there after an hour nor will you precede it and those who disbelieve say we will never believe in this quran nor in that before it but if you could see when the wrongdoers are made to stand before their lord refuting each other's words those who were oppressed will say to those who were arrogant if not for you, we would have been believers. Those who were arrogant will say to those who were oppressed, did we avert you from, from guidance after it? It had come to you. Rather, you were criminals. Those who were oppressed will say to those who were arrogant, rather, it was your conspiracy of night and day when you were ordering us to disbelieve in Allah and attribute to him equals, but... They will all confide regret when they see the punishment and we will put shackles on their necks of those who disbelieve. Will they be recompensed except for what they used to do? And we do not send into a city any warner except that its affluent said, indeed, we in that with which you were sent are disbelievers. And they said, we are more than the believers in wealth and children, and we are not to be punished. Say, indeed, my Lord extends provisions for whom he wills and restricts it, but most of the people do not know. Allahumma kfini an halalika an haramik wa agnini bi fadlika amman sivak. And it is not your wealth or your children that bring you nearer to us in position, but it is by being one who has believed and done righteousness. 
from them. There will be the double reward for what they did, and they will be in the upper chambers of paradise, safe and secure. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannatul firdaus, rabbibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah. And the ones who strive against the verses to cause them failure, those will be brought into the punishment to remain. Say, indeed, my Lord extends provisions for whom he wills of his servants and restricts it for whom whatever things you spend in his cause, he will compensate it, and he is the best of providers. And mention the day when he will gather them and then say to the angels, did these people used to worship you? They will say, exalted are you, you, O Allah, are the benefactor, not them. Rather, they used to worship the jinn. Most of them were believers in them. But today, you do not hold for one another the power of benefit or harm. And we will say to those who wronged, taste the punishment of fire, which you used to deny. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. And when our verses were recited to them as clear evidence, they say, this is not but a man who wishes to avert you from what that which your fathers were worshipping. And they say, this is not except a lie invented. And those who disbelieve say of the truth when it has come to them, this is not but obvious magic. And we had not given them any scriptures which they could study, and we had not sent to them before you any warner, and those before them denied, and the people of Mecca have not attained a tenth of what we had given them, but the former people denied my messenger, so how terrible was my reproach. Say, I only advise you one of the things, that you stand for Allah, seeking truth, in peers and individually, and then give a thought. There is not in your companion who, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, any madness. He is only a warner to you before a severe punishment. Say, whatever payment I might have asked of you, it is yours. My payment is only from Allah, and he is over all things a witness. Say, indeed, my Lord projects the truth, nor of the unseen. Say, the truth has come and falsehood can neither begin anything nor repeat it. Say, if I should err, I would only err against myself. But if I am guided, it is by what my Lord reveals to me. Indeed, he is hearing and near. And near. If you could see when they are terrified, but there is no escape, and they will be seized from a place nearby. And they will then say, we believe in it, but how for them will be the taking of faith from a place far away? And they had certainly disbelieved in it before and would assault the unseen from a place far away. And prevention will be placed between them and what they desire, as was done with their kind before. Indeed, they were in disquieting denial. Rabbana, innana amanna, faghfir lana zanubana, waqina azaban nar.